We'll do the pledge and the call to order. Uh, okay. uh, good evening and welcome to the Thursday, December 7th special meeting of the Hopkinton School Committee. I will call the meeting to order at 6 o'clock and ask that we stand and join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hi. So tonight we will begin our meeting by interviewing Dr. Carol Cavanaugh for the position of superintendent of schools. So Dr. Cavanaugh is coming in. Welcome. Put that down. Great. Thank you so Thank you. much for being Thank here. You. My pleasure. Hi. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, John. We have a seat of honor yes. for you. So um, we have allocated about 50 minutes. We have about 10 questions, so okay. you can do that math um, and budget your time accordingly. And the clock is currently working, which is a bonus. Right. Um, so I will just kick it off by asking you to tell us a little bit about why Hopkinton and why now. Okay, um, I have answered similar questions over the last couple of days, and I always begin by saying that if you had asked me a year and a half ago if I would be sitting in this seat, I would have absolutely said no. I would not be sitting in this chair right now. Um, but over the last year and a half, I feel like Kathy McLeod and I have done an awful lot of very good work taking this district in a particular direction. And I feel very passionate about that work, and I would like to continue that work. Um, I feel like there is an exceptionally good leadership team in place in this district right now. They are hardworking people. They are dedicated, passionate people. But they are also um, people who are um, very willing to do whatever we ask of them. And so they are um, a team that I think is, is probably second to none, and I've worked in a few school districts. Over the last decade, I think I've done a lot of work to prepare myself for this kind of a position. I had been an English teacher and Latin teacher and English department chair for a number of years, both in the Auburn Public Schools and in the Westboro Public Schools. In my time in Auburn for seven years, I had been a teacher association president, and I can assure you that that is a thankless position, but it's one that really helps you to understand the nature of contracts and contract language and the kind of um, interactions that can be very healthy between a teacher's association and administration. When I was at Westboro High School, I took on the role of assistant principal for five years, and at the same time, I had also owned and operated an educational consulting business. So because of that, the school pretty much gave me autonomy over the kinds of professional development work. So I did run a lot of that at Westboro High School, and I found that really fulfilling. I wasn't sure that I was going to enjoy being an assistant principal because a lot of the work that you do there is disciplinary, but I think it was a very nice balance of curricular work and, and disciplinary work. In 2008, I went back to Lesley University to earned my PhD and I did that in literacy instruction specifically grades 6 to 12 writing but I've also started to uh, do a lot of work around content area and disciplinary literacy and sort of building tech sets and having kids make meaning of different genres so that's sort of where my work is right now in terms of of literacy and curriculum so when I got to Hopkinton I didn't really know much more about this town than um, then at one time it had been rather agrarian and it was changing very rapidly. And um, as I said last night in my public forum, I think that this town is kind of a funny place because when people get very enthusiastic about things, they make magic happen. So whether it's Hopkinton Center for the Arts or a new cross country trail or the way we give kids I think an awful lot of control over their learning and we empower them in particular ways. Um, it's just a wonderful place to be. It's, it's very, it's Nirvana and I would like to, to stay here in this role. Thank you. Thank you. So as you know, Hopkinton is a community that invests in its schools and we take a lot of pride in our many accomplishments. Uh, what do you see as a vision for taking the district forward? In the last 
year and a half, I have done an awful lot of work, I think, with K-5 to literacy. So when we look at Tier 1 instruction, we have worked very hard to ensure that our Tier 1 instruction is exceptional in literacy. And did that mean bringing in a K-3 to literacy coach? And that was, you know, obviously an investment on the part of the district. And, and so we have done that. And we have foundations in place for K-2. to We use guided reading. K to five, anyone who's sort of struggling with that gets additional foundations or just words in grade four and level literacy intervention. So I would say that that works for most kids. I think when we think about where we're going to go with the district moving forward, we have to think very hard about the kids who are not in the middle of that continuum. So what about our kids who need extension activities because you know something else in the way of reading and writing would be would be wonderful. And what about the kids who aren't kind of keeping pace? One thing that I have noticed is that um, when we get to tier three instruction or when we get to that place where we think a student needs something highly specialized there is a great opportunity for us to build those programs here um, and uh, i have been working with you know very in, in the incipient stages really with some cpac parents and i've been uh, communicating with a person at desi who had been in the cambridge public schools and had built some programs and now, Meg, who's in the audience tonight, is really the person who um, connected me with him. But Kathy and I will be talking to him next Thursday afternoon, and I think that that's probably just a start for us. I know that there are clearly budget constraints. You know, you sort of can't just build this empire um, unless you have uh, kind of a vision monetarily to do it as well. And so one of the things that I think is we have lots of learning specialists in our districts, and district, and if we made them even more specialized people so that we started to bring in those kinds of programs for uh, intensive special needs or moderate special needs that we just qu aren't quite hitting with our tier one and tier two that might be a place for us to go um, we've been you know looking at math pathways and hopefully there will be a change in place next year in the eighth grade so that it will not be so prohibitive and most of our kids will get to calculus when i say most i mean most of our kids will get to calculus before they graduate from hopkinton high school uh, so those are a couple of the things that, that I think are really important. The other thing that I think is really important is taking a look at our changing demography. And, you know, I talk about that all the time in these settings. But uh, if we look at what has even happened this year. So since we submitted information to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on October 1st, you have to tell them all of the data of all the children who are enrolled in your school and since October 1st we've had 38 students come into the district but only five leave so we've had a net gain of 33 kids um, I think that we have students who are arriving with IEPs and when we read those IEPs we can say that we need to build some additional kinds of programs whether they are behavioral or social emotional um, you know because I talk about it all the time that we have lots of L students arriving in our district net gain is 55 and we are still testing kids today right so um, that that's a group and then I also think about uh, the kids who might be living in low-income housing so one of the things that we know about students who live in low-income housing and this doesn't refer to every child who lives in low-income housing but sometimes kids from low-income uh, backgrounds come to us with different kinds of language uh, deficits and it only is because they haven't really been exposed to language so where a socioeconomically disadvantaged student might give you a sentence that is um, just a declarative sentence about the same topic you might have a student who isn't doesn't fit that category who will use an interjection or an introductory clause or phrase something in the interrogative so how do we build those vocabularies and how do we build those language structures for kids who come to us without them um, so I guess those are my areas for my key areas for growth thank you thank you um, as you know, our budget typically makes up about 52% of the overall town budget. Um, so given the constraints of municipal budgets, how would you collaborate with other town boards and departments to ensure that we can build a responsible town-wide budget, but still make sure that we have appropriate investments in the schools? When I look at um, a school budget at at 52 percent you know there are the places that may be in terms of percentage a little bit higher than that but what I always say is that numbers don't lie and so when we look at 
you know, students who are coming into the districts and the needs of those students who are coming into the district and the kinds of personnel we need to best service them. And we know the, the percentage of uh, a budget that's made up of teacher salaries. It's pretty enormous. But I think that we have to first and foremost take a look at programming, right? I, I find it really unconscionable to take programs and, and slash them because we don't, um, we don't think that we have sort of the money to do that. But I think that with the kind of growth that we're seeing, there may also be, you know, kinds of revenues that we can look at as well. Title III, which is uh, money that you get for English language learners, when I have looked uh, to compare us to where our, our leg districts are in terms of Title III money, you know, it's probably less than $20,000. So that's not a whole lot of money that will help us out there. Um, but you know, as I, I look at the Department of Revenue website in Massachusetts, in FY16, we had $54 million worth of new growth value in Hopkinton. In FY17, we had $101 million worth of new growth value. So it clearly doubled the new growth value within a single year's time. So that means we have a lot of kids coming into our district probably who are going to inhabit those homes. Uh, we know, also know that people who are baby boomers, who are 65, who are selling their homes in Hopkinton, those homes are being scooped up very quickly, right, by people who have children because they're selling three and four bedroom homes and young families are moving in. So I think that as the superintendent, you really just have to advocate for the needs of children and for the best services, not just for some of our children, but for all of our children. And, you know, when we look at other countries and the kinds of things that they do with education, very often other countries focus on education. And I think in the United States and here in Hopkinton more specifically, we focus on the whole child. We like to give them athletics, we like to give them extracurriculars, we like to give them clubs and activities and travel, um, music, art opportunities. And I, I think that that really enhances the opportunity for every kid here and I would never want that to be taken away. As I've had conversations with, you know, Colleen Janino, Craig Hay, they will talk to me about specific kids who along the way have been so markedly influenced by art that they have pursued careers and even kids who have majored in business have minored in art and been able to sort of parlay um, careers out of those two things together. So I, I would find it sort of unconscionable to, to not to be the person who advocates best for the children of, of Hopkinton. I mean, ultimately, it is a town decision on how we spend our money, but I feel like it would be my job if I were the successful candidate to present data, present information, and really make cohesive arguments in favor of the schools. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh, you spoke a little bit about special education when you started off. Can you speak to the challenges that we are facing in the district related to special education? And how have you worked with your current team to make improvements? And how do you envision the role of the superintendent in addressing these challenges? With the current team, and I guess I'll give a very specific anecdote, uh, I had a, a group of eighth grade teachers who got in touch with me and said, we really need some help in, in terms of curriculum. And so I said, oh, that's my job. I'm happy to come over. And once I got into the room, I realized that curriculum was only a very small part of the problem. Um, there's uh, a group of kids in the middle school who are you know, categorized as students with intensive needs. And when we took a look at each of those individual kids' profiles, they are very uh, different from one another. They have different diagnoses. They have different abilities. Um, and when I say different abilities, some of those children might be, you know, at a third grade reading level in ELA, but they can actually access, you know, math at a seventh grade level. So um, I, I think we need to start looking at individual children and start building programs in that way. And what that will very likely mean is that we need to take the personnel that we have and, and better train them. I am interested in bringing programs in, into Hopkinton. Um, in the kinds of programs that will best serve students who have Down syndrome, students who have autism, students who have uh, dyslexia, students who have you know, ADHD. We have to t start taking a look at those kinds of best fits. Uh, today I was working with some of the beginning teachers and one of the things that we did was we watched a, a TED talk about neuroplasticity in the brain and the kinds of things that you can really do when um, 
when we know that there are children who have needs. So uh, there are times in your brain when there just would be chemical activity there because you kind of make that happen and it feels like in the here and now we know. But until you actually restructure <coughs> uh, what's happening in the brain, um, kids don't really own that reading or own that math. And I, I think that if we know that there's a child reading at a third grade level in the seventh grade, we need to be able to get that kid the kind of explicit instruction that would be very different from his peers. So one size fits all is, is not going to work. Um, and, and that's sort of what I see uh, to be a huge issue with special education. I'm also a little bit concerned about the change in MCAS testing because in um, 2000, 19, the grade 10 kids are going to take the new MCAS for the first time. And they're giving us a three-year grace period. And so what I mean by the three-year grace period is that there will be, to, ha to have your competency determination, there will be three years over which the competency determination continues to get <coughs> a little bit more rigorous. I think we have to be very cautious because right now, um, most of our students on IEPs are in fact passing MCAS and um, earning a high school diploma, but I just want to make sure that uh, we have plans in place as that test becomes more rigorous uh, for our kids to continue to get a high school diploma and to be able to go on to whatever postgraduate work they, they want to do. I'm not sure if I've answered your whole question. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Kavanaugh, in your um, discussion about your vision, you already mentioned diversity and our growing mm -hmm. population. Um, and so I know you've spoken a little bit about this already, but maybe thinking more big picture, um, what are the, the sort of big picture challenges um, facing Hopkinton as a community as our diversity continues to, to grow? And what kind of leadership efforts do you think are needed to encourage a, a commitment to, the ex to this excellence through diversity? So I've been working on that a little bit. And I think that some of my work has um, come out of, you know, sort of my own recognition that we need to move in this direction, but um, Nancy and I are sort of co-chairing the Bullying, Pre Bullying Prevention and Intervention uh, Plan Revision Committee, and in that setting, we've had students who have shared with us, you know, some concerns about the kinds of things that uh, may not actually qualify as traditional bullying, yet nonetheless, they kind of... Uh, they kind of seep into that category. So uh, one of our kids who is rather articulate said, you know, it's not that typical bullying where you steal a kid's lunch money, but it's the kind of bullying where people say things that are hurtful again and again, and people are there and it's kind of uncomfortable. And so we, we laugh, but it's a half-hearted laugh, despite the fact that we've been through all of that upstander, bystander curriculum for years and years. Um, to be that true upstander might be social suicide. He, he said. And it was shortly after that that I had uh, begun to look to see what kinds of programs we actually did have in district. And when I met with the middle school guidance department, they did say that a lot of the older problems that we might have had, you know, for example, kids using other kinds of slurs that might be um, gender or oriented sexual orientations, those kinds of slurs, those have kind of faded in uh, favor of not really knowing how to get along with the cultural other, right? So there does seem to be that disconnect. And at one time, 10 years ago, this district was 94% white. Today, the district is 84% white district-wide at center school, 78% white. So I know that there are uh, groups who are very eager to think about how to promote that kind of equity and acceptance among um, dif different ethnic groups, um, gender orientations, racial groups, and that sort of thing. But I think that we're working too much right now in silos. So I think we have Hopkinton Youth and Family Services, and they do a wonderful job. We've got a group of parents who have been you know, doing um, evenings in public schools and trying to you know, bring about awareness, and yet they're still sort of working you know, by themselves. If you go into the public schools, we've got understanding our differences at Hopkins. We've got the power of we at the middle school. Um, we have things like best buddies. We've got, I mean, as you walked in tonight and went past that bulletin board, you could see you know, LGBT you know, groups. There's all kinds of groups everywhere, but I think if we all could get together, um, 
periodically and think about what that momentum and what that motion forward looks like and how to bring people together, not just within our schools and in these smaller groups, but really a whole community. I know Natick has a nice model that's up and running. It was very grassroots, parent generated, their SPARK program. Uh, the young lady who's in our bullying group uh, talked about uh, a group in Shrewsbury called STOP. And STOP is something that originated in Sudbury, I think probably 20 years ago. But she had agreed that she was going to reach out to them and I would reach out to Natick and just have some, you know, incipient conversations about that. So that's, that I think is something that as a whole community, it, it really needs to be addressed when um, when I worked in Westboro, our uh, demography, we were just under 70% white, hovering in that 68, 69. And the other day I looked just out of curiosity and they're at 58%. So I would imagine that we have that, you know, sort of rapid change that's just maybe a few years behind, you know, someone who's just uh, down Route 135. So um, it's really important, I think, that culturally we start to, to recognize and accept um, each other. And I'm not a fan of that sort of word tolerance so much as I am about respect and, and acceptance. Um, the last thing I'll say on this topic is that um, I had been to a job-alike meeting last Friday and I walked into a 5-6 school and there in the glass display case was a really lovely uh, display and the theme in there was kind is the new cool. You know, and so I think it's just really nice to think about how can we be kind to one another? You know, under all of those umbrellas, how can we be kind to one another? Thank you. Um, so the superintendent has sort of a dual role as a leader of educators and as a leader in the community. Um, could you talk about what you think are, is your greatest strength in each of those roles and maybe an area of growth for you in each of those roles? Sure. Um, I think with the leader of educators, because I have been one for a very long time, I think that that's just sort of a, a natural strength um, I've done. And maybe because I've had an educational consulting business, I've been able to work with teachers from K to 12 uh, for a number of years. And I think that I understand the curriculum in those kinds of places. I understand you know, all different ways to um, arrive at the same learning goals. And I think that teachers honestly see me as sort of an authority along those lines. So if somebody calls me, like the middle school teachers, and say, you know, we need something for To Kill a Mockingbird, and it's got to be written at a fourth grade level, I will be able to produce that for them with several supplemental materials and say, this this will get you through a week. And um, <laughs> accordingly, in one of my small sessions yesterday, someone said to me, I really don't want you to get this job because I want you to keep doing what you're doing. Um, but on, the, on that more political side, I think um, you have to have really good relationships with the other boards in town. One thing I've been saying fairly consistently is that in some other districts, it's very easy to establish those relationships. And it is because geographically, a lot of town departments are housed in the same building. So on Monday morning, when you come to work and you see the person who is the director of the highway department and you say, how was your weekend? You sort of establish a rapport that's just very natural because you're always in the same place. But we don't really have that luxury. So how will it be to then establish relationships with the town manager, the highway department, the police department, the fire department and I've seen in central office firsthand the need to make that happen if we you know just go back a few weeks to when we had the downed trees and the downed power lines we were literally scrambling around that office it was an all hands on deck deck event because you know we knew that there were places where buses were not going to be able to pass and we knew we didn't want kids getting off the bus there and deciding that they could walk past a down power line because it was just on the other side of that power line where they lived so it was really a matter of getting information to buses but it was all in the moment because even as kids were coming to school that morning trees were falling and power lines were going down so um, I think it's critical to have those relationships because we have those events all the time where we need to be communicating with fire, we need to communicate with police, we need to communicate with the highway department. You know, impending blizzard, I'm going to need to be talking to someone, you know, hourly, right? Um, but unless you have established those relationships that are kind of ongoing and respectful, I don't think that that's going to just naturally happen. It's something that you have to really work at. And, uh, you know, I think that that will be an area of growth for me to, to establish those kinds of relationships, um, given, you know, our, our geography. 
I mean, that's not to say that I haven't been in settings with, you know, folks like the police chief, Steve Slayman, um, you know, Highway Department, and, and all of those groups, but I think it's about building something bigger than that. And whether that means that we have, we decide to have sort of monthly meetings or, or those kinds of things, even if they are just very brief to sort of touch base with each other about uh, what seems to be going on. I think that that's critical. Um, and then, of course, with, you know, your town manager and your uh, board of selectmen, there's a lot of budget involved in that. And I think that, you know, when we're talking about budget, we have to have really good relationships. And, and I think that that probably stems from trust, right? Like they, everyone has to understand when it's, it's not trickery. It's, it's this is the data. These are our needs. And we hope that they can be supported. So I, I want to talk a little bit about risk and not power line kind of risk. But, um, <laughs> can you share with us two risks that you've taken in your educational leadership? One that's worked out well for you mm -hmm. and one that has not worked out quite as well and what you've learned from them and how you've been able to apply that. Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with when I moved from being an English teacher to an assistant principal. That did not come about because I was thinking, gosh, I'm dying to be an assistant principal. It came about because, you know, we knew that we had an assistant principal who was going to become the principal of our middle school. And so the principal of the high school came to me and said, would you think about applying to become our new assistant principal? And I thought, oh my, that is not something I really had even considered. You know, I, I always knew that I would want to pursue a path where, um, where I would be a curriculum leader, right? But um, I didn't think that I wanted to be a disciplinarian. You know, in a classroom, you always have very good relationships with your kids. They just kind of come organically and naturally. And then when you remove yourself from that and you're no longer a teacher, you get yourself in this place that's very disciplinary. So I had asked at the time if I, if I were to apply and if I were the successful candidate, could it be written into my contract that I could return to the classroom with no breach of service in the event that I wasn't happy in that role. And I think we, we sort of managed to, to make it fine as long as I had uh, a lot of work with teacher evaluation, teacher coaching, professional development, which is really my area of interest. And so that was a risk that I took at the time that I think worked out very well for me. And I think one of the things I learned there was, you know, sort of that that art of negotiation, right? What would it be about the job that would be very appealing to me? And, and I stayed in that role for five years. So it, it really was a job that I actually enjoyed very much um, doing. And I think that uh, I made a lot of good relationships with teachers in that, in that setting as well. So I, I really loved that position. Um, I guess another thing that, that I had done when I left Westboro and became a K-12 curriculum director, I think um, that I was in that district for a short period of time. And it was a budgetary issue that kind of uh, led to my coming to Hopkinton. So, uh, you know, everything sort of happens for a reason, and, and that was great. But I think what I learned there was... Um, that if you want to make a change, change is not going to happen in a half year's time or 10 months time, because I, I felt like a lot of the work I had done there might be something that would continue on, right? And then I even started to realize that even while I was in the district, there was that notion that this too shall pass, right? So if you want things to, to sort of um, have that kind of longevity, then it's you have to keep working toward it a lot, right? And you have to keep um, sort of uh, massaging egos and you have to make people feel very comfortable and you have to sort of be there to pick up the pieces. When I first um, started, sort of got into that, that whole role of administration and leadership, I had a very good friend who said to me, in this role, it's not going to be easy, but you'll, and you'll make a whole lot of decisions. And he said, a lot of the decisions people aren't going to like, but they will respect you if you do two things. And one thing was um, if you can explain to them why you're making this decision. And the second one is if you can support them when it starts to get very difficult, right? So there, there was that piece where I started to recognize that I needed to use those tools, that idea of supporting people who were feeling uncomfortable in, in that particular setting. Yeah. Great, thank you. 
Can you tell us about a, a fairly recent scenario in the district where you've had to bring together members of the leadership team, members of the community, and any other stakeholders to solve a problem within the district? How you approached it, how it turned out, and in hindsight, what you might do differently? Hmm. I'll have to think about that one. Yeah, and I'm not sure about the community piece. Um, and maybe I guess I will I'll use sort of my CPAC example. Um, I have been invited to talk at CPAC twice. And, you know, the first time I went there, I kind of had this feeling that, um, that there's sort of a tension that exists before between the special education parents group and and the schools right and and i feel like that tension should not exist right and and yet you know my perception is that it does so the second time that i was invited to talk at cpac um, i thought i'm going in there and it's going to be my plan to really listen to see you know what um what i can learn in this in this setting and you know, I went through all kinds of MCAS data and instructional data and, and those things. And I got the sense that um, a lot of the frustration level comes because um, the, the parents of these children who are not making the effective progress that the parents would like to see are starting to feel that kind of frustration. And I'll, I'll be very honest with you, I understand why. You know, it, when, when you get into that thing where you say, okay, there's tension here, in terms of empathy, you have to stand in everyone's shoes and really think hard about what it is that they are feeling and thinking and wanting. So on that night, one of the parents came out into the high school lobby with me, and she had explained um, that, you know, her child hadn't gotten the right math instruction um, while, while her child was in the Hopkinton Public Schools. And I didn't disagree. Right? I, I thought someone made a curricular decision. I don't know who or how, but, um, but that was a decision that was made. And I don't think that having heard all the circumstances that, that everything was done that should have or could have been done. So that gets me to this place where I understand. And I think when, um, when I was asked afterward to meet with a couple of special education parents, I, I welcome the opportunity to do that, to sort of hear the, the frustrations and what they've gone through. And I have to be very frank with them. In my role as assistant superintendent, what I can do is I can bring programming and curriculum to, to the schools, right? I obviously have... Um, sort of special education personnel are, are out of my, my jurisdiction, so to speak. But, in, and I don't want to say that any of this has happened um, in a vacuum because I have gone to Dr. McLeod and said, this is what I'm hearing and I think this, these are some of the things we need to do. And I've gone to Dr. Zaleski and said, this is what I'm hearing and these are some of the things I need to do. So there, you know, even though we're at the beginning of that, I think that we have needed to bring in parents to really listen to them, to go even outside our own committee and uh, community and think about who are special education experts who are out there that can help us with this process. You know, there are school districts that have built beautiful programs. I think maybe 15 years ago, I can remember when Newton was undergoing their change and they were building very specialized programs and housing them in different buildings so that if your child was a child who had a particular learning need, that child would go to this school or that school or that school. And, you know, Newton is much larger and they have a, a different budget from the one that Hopkinton has, but I don't think that that should preclude us from thinking that we can build these kinds of programs and maybe it will be a, a slow and steady process because as I just answered it, it won't happen overnight it won't happen in four months it may not happen in the next year but I think over you know several years this is something that we could really become you know sort of like it could be a hallmark of education here and I'm kind of excited about that. Dr. Kavanaugh, what do you see is the role of the superintendent in the classroom? And how do you identify and measure excellent teaching and learning? Well, yesterday, someone did say to me, are you going to be able to give up all of this, you know, curriculum and that, and that kind of stuff? And so I think 
for me, the answer to that would be no. I would still be very invested in what is happening in our classrooms. And I think that the superintendent has to have that high visibility, right? You have to be in classrooms because at the end of the day, your clientele are the 3,500 kids who attend the Hopkinton Public Schools. And so you've got to be in there and watching what teaching and learning looks like. Um, how do you know what excellent teaching looks like? The very first thing I say to myself whenever I walk into a classroom is what are the kids doing from the neck up, right? Because sometimes our teachers work extra hard and our kids don't work hard enough, right? So if we have that sense that they are cognitively engaged and, and what does that look like? Are they dialoguing about something? Are they wrestling with ideas? Are they writing? Are they so, and you know, writing cognitively might be the most demanding thing we do, right? So it may be silent and you might see kids responding with a few sentences. But what's lovely about that is it gives them fodder to talk about after and to mess around with ideas. I always wonder what kids are doing from the neck up, right? Um, when you walk into a classroom and a teacher asks a question and only one kid answers, the moment one kid puts his hand up, the other 24 think it's not me, right? So that sort of shuts them down. So how do we get them all engaged? And I think I even saw that in um, a wellness class last week, or a PE class. I, I watched the kids in RAD, and while they were waiting in a line to get to the front to do something with this sort of dummy that is there, the teacher had them actually pair up and try some of those RAD moves. So they were constantly engaged in learning as opposed to just standing in line. But I think we also, we have other ways of knowing what really good teachers look like. And one of the things that's in the state regulations is that we get feedback from students. Again, they are our clients and they really are very good at telling you what, what works and what doesn't work and, and the ways in which they learn. So I think that when kids give feedback to teachers and they do that respectfully, it's, it's a very good way for us to know. And I don't think I necessarily need to look at what every single kid is saying about every single teacher, but it would be my hope that teachers are looking at what kids have to say about them and that they are using that information to drive better instruction. Another way that we know what good teaching looks like, um, when, you know, and you, and you hate to use this as an example, but when we look at student work, right, we have portfolio data, we have uh, uh, progress monitoring data, we have end of year holistic data that kind of comes in the form of MCAS. And, I, you know, I've used this example before, but if we took the Elmwood School grade three and we took their star math data, the data is measured so that achievement is at the top and growth is over to the right. So what you're kind of hoping is that everybody ends up in that top right-hand quadrant. And um, it's amazing to look at their data because, sure, you could have achievement and everybody could be up at the top, but they may have come in that bright. But if we have growth and achievement, all, all 12 teachers who teach in the third grade over there are clustered at the top of that chart. You know, so then we say, well, I wonder why we have such phenomenal math scores coming out of Elmwood, but that's teacher efficacy, and that's a way for me to know that those teachers are doing a really darn good job. Uh, so we can observe their practice. We can even look at, you know, the kinds of uh, materials and lessons they're designing. We can get feedback from kids. We can look at some of that testing data, but there are lots of hundreds of ways for us to really know what, what good teaching looks like. But I think that those four um, might be things that if we did them all the time, they would be really helpful for us to know. Uh, one of the things that I would love, um, currently we have PLCs in the district and I think that um, however those happened and obviously predates me, but however that happened, um, that's, that's brilliant work. Because when you put teachers together to talk concretely about teaching and learning and to look at student work, I think that what we're getting at there um, is, is a way for us to sort of share knowledge and share best practices in settings that are very safe, right? Um, and if we know that there's a teacher in that PLC who needs a little bit of work, three people can work with that person. Or if we know there are a few people who could uh, bolster their math instruction, we can hire a math coach, right? So we can get at, at raising uh, teacher efficacy, which will in turn raise student achievement. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so you, you've spoken a little bit about this, but um, just specifically, what do you think about innovation in education in our district? What what does it look like, or what would it look like in our district? One of the things that we are currently looking at, and this came to us from tech, and um, so we're looking at things like blended and personalized learning. 
Uh, we have uh, some kids who, you know, in terms of personalized learning, could probably really soar if you gave them something that they were, you know, sort of really passionate about and, and they could pursue that. Um, with blended learning, I think that, you know, we do a little bit of that with things like Google Classroom, but I would love to see more blended learning. And I think that if we look at higher education, so when kids leave Hopkinton High School, um, that's the kind of, of, of learning that I think would really behoove them to have a taste of that when they're in high school. We have some wonderful things through, like Science Fair, for example, right? We have a group of kids who do phenomenal things every year. But in terms of building that STEM and STEAM program, I think that that is something that could promote a whole lot of innovation. We just sent out that survey. We've had 90 parents who have responded to that. And they've responded in very interesting ways. Some who will say, I'd be happy to come and help out at, at STEM or STEAM night. And others who have said to us, you know what, for your anatomy and physiology class, I actually have access to um, filmed operations so you can you know watch uh, and I think that is wildly innovative that in an anatomy class would simply you know, blow kids away right so there are those kinds of opportunities for us to just sort of keep reaching and thinking and and doing things that I think are um, you know personalized or generalized but things that we're not currently doing and whether it, it involves you know technology to do that or just um, you know, sort of good old-fashioned getting out into the community. Like, I wonder if we, you know, sort of tap into our Chamber of Commerce. Yesterday, talking to uh, Denise Hildreth, you know, she'll talk about some of the students that she works with. And, you know, what does it mean for them if they're not really academics, right? Like, you know, they're sort of holding their own. But at, at the end of the day, they don't feel like they're excited to go to a four-year college and pursue a degree in whatever. But they are very much interested in something like, you know, landscape architecture. Is there a way for them to get out into the community and start to sort of make meaning and understand what that looks like and decide, is that something that I want to pursue on my own or is it not? Uh, one of the parents who was in our group talked a lot about um, a, a person who had, you know, actually, you know, gone and, and built up a trade business for himself and then went off to a four-year college and at the same time had you know built sort of a landscaping empire but had done all of those things within you know in the community of Hopkinton but just based on sort of his own passions so there are a lot of things I think that we could be doing but it's just a matter of you know finding the right people to to do that um, there is no shortage of uh, teachers in this district who are willing to do all kinds of things. I mean, our people who are doing STEM and STEAM, it's entirely voluntary. And they are doing some amazing things already. And we've only been in business for a year. So <laughs> it's exciting. Um, so I'll ask you another question. And then I want to make sure we have time at the end if, there's qu if there are questions that you have for us in particular. But um, from the standpoint of your own career, could you identify three of the most important co accomplishments you feel like you've made as an educator? Uh, well, I certainly think that uh, earning my, my doctorate was really important for me. And when, this is maybe not going to sound like the best response, but I think when I started that program, I felt like I know so much about writing instruction <laughs> because I've been doing this for years and years and years. Um, but then it becomes a very humbling process because um, you start to realize how much you don't know. And I think that that's what that whole process is about is, is sort of humbling you to understand there is so much more out there that, that people just, you know, that there is to learn and then you realize that there are all of these other areas um, where there's amazing concentrations of learning that so many people don't don't quite you know get to um, I think uh, being in this role as assistant superintendent for my uh, most of my professional life I would say that that was that was the one role that I, I wanted to have I wanted to be an assistant superintendent in charge of curriculum and instruction like that was sort of a big end goal for me Thank you. And I don't know, I think maybe sort of my last one is not just a singular thing, but um, I am very proud of the teaching career I've had. I was in the classroom for a very, very long time, and um, I loved every day of it. Yeah. After all of these years in education, I wake up in the morning and still so happy to be in it. Hmm. Do you have time to ask a yes, follow-up? Yes, go ahead. That's so do you, can you think of one or two challenges that you would want to 
address in the role if you were appointed as a superintendent? I think it would be challenging. In, you've done so much, and yet everybody has challenges. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there are, are places where, you know, when, when you want to build programs, people will kind of poo-poo you a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, they'll be like, oh, Carol, look at our test scores. And, you know, it's, it's a blessing and a curse to have scores that are as good as ours when you start to build an empire. Sort of everybody wants to be in Hopkinton, but then people want to sort of rest on those laurels, right? So one of the challenges, I think, is to sort of keep propelling people forward even though we are doing exceedingly well. Um, I don't remember where I was yesterday when someone asked me this question, but you know, when you have an elementary school like Elmwood that's fourth in the state in both ELA and math, and you've got a high school that's ranked third and 175th in the state, there's a very it, it could be very easy to grow complacent, right? So you know, sustaining that excellence is one thing, but even going beyond it is a second thing, and I think that that will will certainly be a challenge moving forward. And I think maybe my second challenge is I have a lot of irons in the fire right now. And so um, if I were to be the successful candidate and someone inhabited my role, I would want to ensure that those things continued while I'm still giving that person the latitude to kind of define the role for himself or herself. Um, so finding that balance between, you know, letting go of a few things and still being able to control a few things because I kind of <laughs> like to do that still, right? You know, when you start a project and you're halfway through, you know, it's something that's still pretty dear to you and, sure. yeah, so, you know, and, and that's hard because you have to maintain that personal relationship. It's not just a position, it's a person inhabiting the role, so, yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, are there any um, questions that you have for us or is there anything that we didn't ask you that you wish we had asked you? I don't think that there's anything that you didn't ask. I guess I, I have two questions. I'm wondering what you see as the greatest challenge for the district, and uh, maybe just in a single word or two, what you think would be the most important quality uh, that an incoming superintendent would bring to the role. All right, I'm going to put uh, Jen on the spot, and we'll go this way. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That's the greatest challenge right there. That's why it's nice to be the chair. That's right. <laughs> well, I think. In your closing comments or your com your response to the challenges that she just talked about, I feel like the the piece about how we're we're already doing so well in our district. Part of the reason why I ran for school committee in the first place is because I I want to keep that moving forward, and I think it is a challenge when you're already up here. You know, there's nowhere to go but down. Well, maybe there isn't. Maybe you can keep on getting better, and so that's part of the reason why I came here. So I do think it's going to be a challenge. Um, and then your second question, I'm sorry. What would be the characteristic you would want to see in the new uh, superintendent? Um, in one or two words, huh? Well, you can take <laughs> as many words as you like. <laughs> I, think, I think having someone who is trustworthy, which is such a m sort of multifaceted word, you want someone who you know is going to follow through, who is honest, who is um, hardworking, who is, you know, someone who you can count on to do what's best for all the students in the district. And I think that's, you know, maybe a lot of words, but summed up in that one word, trustworthy. I think that's really important. Thank you. Um, for me, um, you know, I, I think what Jen said absolutely makes sense. Um, and some of the things that I see is the growth in the community, right, and the challenges that come along with it. I think that's huge. Um, also, we have a, a demanding set of parents. Uh -huh. So managing expectations around that, I think that would be a challenge that you would be facing. Um, in terms of the characteristics that I would be looking for uh, in the next superintendent, of course, trust and some of those qualities, but also someone who can inspire inspire and harness the energy and the intelligence that exists in the leadership. Give them room and harness that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd be looking for. Thank you. Um, so I think for me, when I think about educational leadership in this district and, and really almost any district, it's, it's, there's such, it feels like there's such a shift in what is expected of students 
these days. And I don't necessarily even mean the sort of rising sort of traditional academic sc uh, scores, but you hear a lot more about things like critical thinking skills and, and those types of, of skills that don't fit into the traditional reading, writing, and arithmetic. So, so I think um, that continues to be the biggest challenge, which is how do we do everything mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and do it well? And I, so I think that that, that broadening within the constraints of, of a public school district, right? We still have a set amount of hours that we have those kids in school. And, and um, I, so I think that is, is one of the greatest challenges. Um, I think given where we are and where the district ha has come to, I think um, the characteristic I look for, I mean, it, the first thing that popped into my head was the characteristic I look for is somebody who doesn't need a lot of sleep, because that's clearly <laughs> a record of, the, of this job. Yeah. But, um, but the, I think somebody who has the ability to really articulate a clear vision for growth and build a coalition, whether it's the staff within the district, the parents within the town, the other community members within the town, the, the folks at town hall, are really around that vision for what we want this school district to be and how we want it to grow. I think to me that's what I'm looking for in, in the next superintendent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So a lot of, th this is the downside of going at the end. <laughs> I know, there's, a lot I mean, of there's good nothing ideas else to say. Taken. But I think for me, it, it, one of the challenges I see is partly related to growth and partly not related to growth, but in really valuing all the diversity that we already have and the, the increasing diversity that's coming in as we grow, but diversity not just in the traditional sense, but diversity in sexual orientation, culture, socioeconomics, learning abilities, uh, any possible, in helping to build a community where each person's contribution is valued mm -hmm. and it's maybe sounds like a lofty thing but to really that it's not like this but it's ooh, excuse me more of an even playing yes. field and then in terms of there are so many qualities that, <laughs> that I think you have to bring S lack of sleep is one of them for sure but I think the ability to really listen and collaborate and build consensus to move any ideas forward is going to be key so mm -hmm. thank you um, well, I mean, I just heartily concur with everything that's already been said, and you know me well enough to know that I will never pick one word when 10 yeah. are available to me. <laughs> so, um, But I, yeah, I think that the greatest challenge, maybe not for the district, but for the superintendent, is how to, and you alluded to this already um, earlier, how do you be a game changer in a very high-performing district, right? So h how do you keep as you said, how do you avoid complacency? How do you keep things moving forward? But within that, how do you also manage stress for the staff, for the students, um, and meet the expectations of the community as well as the financial considerations mm -hmm. of the community? So I think that that, um, given our changing demographics, um, given the rapid expansion of the town, I think those are going to be some of the greatest challenges. I also think that we may not give enough credit to how big a challenge managing communication and social media and the 24-7 news cycle is. Mm -hmm. I think that's tremendously challenging. As I go to other districts, we are all um, struggling with how to um, control a consistent and positive message in that kind mm -hmm. of an environment. Um, I think in terms of the most important characteristics for a superintendent. Um, it's almost the same as for a student. I think you need to be resilient and determined. Mm -hmm. um, it's great if you don't need a lot of sleep, but I, I think you need to, to be persistent. I think you need to be empathetic, and I think you need to be incredibly trustworthy um, and accountable and, and just be, um, honestly, just have good character. And I think people can feel that and trust that, and, mm -hmm. and that's how you bring people along in whatever path you're taking mm -hmm. so all right okay well thank you well thank you thank so you. much it was a pleasure to speak with you thank you for coming in yes thank you Thanks. all and Thanks. i'll, I'll walk pleasure. you back out although okay. i think you know the way <laughs> do